care of my birthday, my hives out in Osceola swarmed. So I have four hives in a row. There's a tree next to the hives. There was a swarm of bees in the tree. <laughs> it was very obvious it was my bees. So honeybees, if they're healthy, they swarm. It's one of the ways they reproduce. Um, yeah, so that's me catching this one. Um, oh, can I just tell you to... Well, yeah, it's going on my screen when you do that. It's just not going up there. Okay. Ooh, um, so it did switch up there, but then how do you get this one slide to change? Well, Abby hit the arrow, but now I hit the arrow. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> Is sometimes sort of how you point the pointer? I know. Well, it's working on the computer. Can I point it at the computer? Oh, yeah. You might have to point it that way. It's the computer magic. Oh, here's my observation. I have a Tim pre k book. We can go through these. Is that too far? Was it me who just. I might have tried. It might be catching up with clicks. Okay, I'm gonna stop clicking if you tell me what to click. <laughs> I also do advocacy work, so it's hard to be a bee these days. Um, we'll talk more about why we should care about that and what's going on for bees. Um, but uh, the things that we can do to help are things that cities can do, things that uh, we're working on at the state level. MPCA is doing a lot of stuff. Um, Environmental Quality Board is doing a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, and Minnesota is leading the country in the work that we're doing to protect pollinators. And the work we're doing at the state level is catching up with the work that cities are doing. So St. Paul is doing a, a lot of great work protecting pollinators. We're going to talk through the specifics of this <laughs> if my slide show works, or we're going to jump around through things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Welcome. Welcome. Should we have it? Yeah. Is there? So, um, anybody have any ideas how many different species of bee we have here in Minnesota? Twenty-two. Nice. 22. Uh, if you all were kindergartners, we'd vote with our hands. Do you, you want to do that? Do you think we have more than 22 different species of bees? You can raise the roof. Do you think we have less than 22? You can lower the floor. If you think 22 sounds about right, you can put it on the wall. <laughs> more than 22. Other guesses? Yeah. Oh, I don't know how to guess, but I'm, I'm thinking that we must have more than We do, yeah. Because I've seen just in my garden. Right? So to be a bee, you are an insect with, uh, in the order Hymenoptera, which means you have a skinny waist, so ants and wasps and hornets and bees. You have fur, for the most part. You eat pollen, for the most part. Well, you feed it to your babies. And in Minnesota, we have 419 species of bee. Honeybees are one of those species. They are not native to the Americas. So colonizers brought them to the Americas when white folks came to the Americas, and as white folks spread across the Americas, honeybees spread too. So we're learning now if honeybees compete with all our other native pollinators. In some instances, we're finding that they do. Um, about 100 of our native species are specialists, so have a relationship with one flower. And we're learning more about those bees. We have all this data on honeybees. We see them all the time. Um, yeah, and a lot of our native bees are solitary. They live more like butterflies do. So just collecting data on who they are, where they are, how they're doing is more labor intensive. And it also isn't, uh, it's a lot of naturalist jobs to do that, right? But you're not getting the added uh, pollination. Farmers aren't paying you to do that work necessarily. Um, here's me teaching a bunch of kids. Here's the kids putting on food. And hanging out with bees. So this is my work. <laughs> um, there's a lot of joy of having like little bodies in big outfits, right? <laughs> um, yeah, because they tip over easy. <laughs> <laughs> and wearing a big suit means you have lots of room in between you and the bees, right? <laughs> yeah, but like, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of running around and falling over <laughs> until we get close to the beehive and then they're a little calmer, right? 
Um, here's testimony at the Capitol. I'm on the Governor's Pollinator Committee, too. I've worked with St. Paul and Minneapolis on their pollinator resolutions and put together some resources for other cities to do the same. So we're going to be talking about what pollination is, why it's important. This is a lot of like throwback to second grade, right? Um, what's going on with bees, why they're having a hard time, what we're doing in Minnesota, and then how cities are leading the way. And then some resources to help you all, um, yeah, in protecting pollinators. So I don't have this year's data on here, but the Bee Informed Partnership is based in Maryland, and they survey beekeepers every year. So historically, as a beekeeper, we have uh, about 19% of our hives die every year. Honeybees are living things, right? Living things have uh, life cycles. They die. Um, these days, that average is closer to 40 to 50% losses. And the Bee Informed Partnership in, uh, what, 2010 started tracking uh, summertime losses separate from wintertime losses. And the National Agricultural Statistics Service is also tracking this quarterly now, starting last year. But we're finding that about half of the losses in Minnesota happen in the summer. So bees, and this is honeybees, right? We have all those other species of bees, but as beekeepers, I check my hives every seven to 10 days. Just in the inherent work of beekeeping, you have all this data on how they're doing. Um, so, Summertime losses more directly attributed to pesticide use. Winter losses are a test. What do honeybees do in the winter? I that in a weird way, that tends to. Uh, <laughs> they hibernate. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> so, honeybees are totally weirdos in terms of how they've evolved to deal with winter. The reason they make all the honey they make is that they have something to shiver around and eat and keep themselves warm all winter. So this cluster of honeybees in the middle of a hive in January is 70, 80 degrees. And they eat that honey that they've gathered and gathered and gathered and hoarded all summer in the hopes that it'll be enough to get through winter. So that's what I mean by a test. If you don't have enough honey, there isn't a way to get more. If you're weak because you were exposed to a parasite all summer or you were exposed to pesticides all summer, um, there's no way to get strong again in the winter. So the winter is this extra cold test, and a lot of historic beekeeping losses have happened in the winter. But these days, we're seeing kind of equal losses happening in the summer, too, which is striking. One, one other response. Yeah. Um, from where my home is, they load them on semis and bring them to Texas. Yeah, we're going to talk about why beekeepers do that work. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, thanks for that. Do you know what pollination is anyway? As a plant, what does your baby look like? This is a weird question. The word I'm thinking of starts with an S. That day we plant a seed, right? Can you move around to have your seed baby like animals can? No, plant biology is different. You have roots, you're stuck in the ground, you rely on the wind to move your pollen around. Has anybody gotten eaten corn on the cob, gotten those strings stuck in our teeth. Those strings are the female part of the corn plant. Corn is wind pollinated. Those strings are hanging out, hoping, you know, like not actively, um, <laughs> to gather pollen from the wind. Um, if that pollen gets caught by that string, it travels all the way down and fertilizes each individual corn, corn kernel. That's why there are so many strings, right? Um, if you see those little sorry looking kernels that you don't want to eat, they never got pollinated. So maybe you're a wind pollinated thing. You can't control where the wind goes, right? So you just have to take so much pollen in the hopes that it gets to uh, helping you reproduce, to meet with the female part of the flower uh, or plant next door, right? For plants that make flowers, they put all that energy that the wind pollinated things put into tons and tons and tons of pollen into something beautiful with all this green food and then attract somebody to move their pollen for them so they can reproduce. So this is plant sex, right? Bees help plants to grow their babies. And as a bee, uh, when she visits a flower, she has all that hair, she gets covered in pollen, Honeybees, on purpose, will gather that in a little pellet. Um, bumblebees gather pellets of pollen, too. 
are native bees. Some of them have super hairy legs and just gather pollen on their whole legs. Some of them have hairy armpits. Put <laughs> one in their armpits. Some of them have hairy bellies, so you'll see bees at flowers with their butts up in the air, gathering pollen um, on her belly. So they bring that pollen back to where the eggs are for the larva to eat. <laughs> he also is inadvertently moving all this pollen to the next flower. And most flowers are simple flowers, so they have this female part in the same flower. Some plants like you know, squash or ginkgo have like female flowers, male flowers, maybe female plants, male plants. So she visits the next uh, flower with that female part. It's sticky, that pollen gets stuck in there. And just like with the corn, it travels down, fertilizes an egg in the ovary of the flower, turns that egg into a seed. If this is an apple flower, what does this ovary become? An apple, yeah. We eat so many ovaries, which is really fun <laughs> to tell the, you know, fifth graders or seventh graders. Um, <laughs> yeah, so bees are not the only animals that do this work, eating food from flowers, accidentally moving pollen around to help plants reproduce, but they're super good at it because they have all this hair. So butterflies aren't as hairy, beetles aren't as hairy. But a lot, a lot, a lot of different animals do that work. Um, so we have over 400 different kinds of bees. If you think of everything that evolved in uh, the Americas plant-wise, it evolved without honeybees. So honeybees are really crappy pollinators of things like tomatoes. They can't do it. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so tomatoes, you have to be big and fat and buzz that pollen out. So who do you think does that? Who's like our fattest? Bumblebees, yeah. We have 24 different kinds of bumblebees in Minnesota. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a lot of relationships between flowers and pollinators. So we talk about bees a lot because they're critically linked to our food system. So Whole Foods did this maybe six, seven years ago now, but the picture on your left is the produce section. And the picture on the right is the produce section with everything that honeybees this one species pollinate removed. So um, we have navel oranges because they're self-pollinated, and then uh, most of our other fruits, nuts, vegetables, are things that honeybees help us to grow because of this story that you were talking about. Um, so honeybees live in boxes. They have really high population numbers compared to everybody else. So bumblebees live in colonies in the summer, but their colonies are like 300, 300 individuals at most. And a honeybee hive in July can be 50,000 individuals. Um, this Langstroth hive box um, <laughs> is something that mimics the way that honeybees live in the wild with vertical freestanding comb. So uh, we give them these frames to be bossy and we can check on them. We can move this box around the country and we do. The way that we grow food these days requires beekeepers to move bees all around the country. So we grow in monocultures. These are almonds. This is strawberries. In Minnesota, our main crops are corn, uh, soybeans, sugar beets, corn and soybeans. Corn is wind pollinated. Soybeans are self-pollinated. Our main agricultural crops in Minnesota do not rely on honeybee pollination. But if you are a farmer that's growing a fruiting thing, um, you rely on insect pollinators for the most part. And almonds, we grow 80% of the world's almonds in Northern California. They are 100% insect pollinated. So if you ever had a lopsided apple, apples have five spots that get pollinated, five carpels, five parts of that female part of the flower. And if one or two of them doesn't get pollinated, you still get an apple. It's just not as big and fat and delicious. Um, Almonds are different. You need to get pollinated in order to get a nut. So if we're growing that many almonds in Northern California, they have that much pollination demand. It requires all the beekeepers, pretty much, who move hives in the country to move them out to California to pollinate almonds. And every, all apple growers in Minnesota require insect pollination. Cranberry farmers in Wisconsin require uh, beekeeper pollination. So the story that you were talking about, about putting hives 
on semis, driving them around the country is work that a lot of folks do. So I have 24 hives. I'm working hard to overwinter my bees here. But the average number of hives for a commercial beekeeper in Minnesota is about 2,000. And most folks go out to almonds. You get $200 a hive to pollinate almonds these days. So it supports your livelihood. In a time when it's hard to be a bee, your hive loss numbers are high. Your honey production numbers are low. This pollination services income is helps you continue to be a beekeeper. And some folks are going down to Texas to raise bees for the industry. Some folks, usually in Minnesota, people go to California and then come back. The reason to come back to Minnesota is that historically, we've been an awesome spot to be a bee. We have a bunch of food here. We've had a lot of uh, you know, clean spaces for bees. And these days, that, that's getting harder. Um, it's hard to find a good spot to keep your bees. We used to be the fifth uh, largest honey producing state. This past year was the sixth. So I don't know if those two things are linked. <laughs> I haven't watched the honey market that closely to see what the historical data is, you know, like where we have them. But uh, yeah, you bring your hands up here to produce honey and to get strong enough to do this rest of the work that uh, is required of honey. So alternatives could be replacing part of your farm field with uh, flowers. Right? If you are a bee and you're in almonds in February, you have a feast, right? But if you're a bee who lives in an almond orchard in November, is there anything to eat? That ecosystem is pretty much just almonds. Almond growers work hard to take out the weedy understory because the way we harvest our almonds is to shake all the trees and then scoop them all up. So if there's stuff growing underneath, you scoop up all the stuff too. Yeah. So if you're there in November, you don't have anything to eat. And as a living thing, you need something to eat all the time, right? <laughs> so we started late. How long do you want me to talk? Yeah. <laughs> when was I planning on being done? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm 50, which you would still have like two. Okay. Yeah. I did have another question about the, their food source. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that um, another important feed source for Minnesota that's benefited by bee pollinators is alfalfa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and that's true, right? Like, we historically have had a lot of um, pieces of farmland that would feed bees. Um, fence rows, alfalfa was something that you used to let bloom before you harvest it. Now we harvest it earlier than that because it's higher protein content before it puts energy into the flower. So a lot of our alfalfa is harvested before it can feed anybody bee Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was just curious because you were describing the, the way that the pollen are grown in California and how they harvest depend on the situation. Yeah. So if um, on a smaller scale, like in an integrated farming right. system, then we don't have them. Yeah. We would have this kind of farming scale. Yeah, exactly. So it really has to do with how because things are produced, how the are produced. Because we farm the way we do, we rely uh, mm -hmm. on honeybee pollination and on beekeepers doing this work. Uh, Farms don't have to look the way that they look, um, but with us growing in this monoculture food system that we have, um, beekeepers are required to put their hives on semis and drive them around the country. Yeah, but if we had smaller integrated farms with more habitat for pollinators and other beneficial insects on farm, you would be able to not pay beekeepers to move colonies in, to manage hives of your own and have that meet your pollination needs, right? Um, and there's a lot of different organizations, including the Xerxes Society, that works with farmers to increase on-farm habitat for beneficial insects like bees, and then predators who eat the pests that eat your crops. Yeah. What kind of, like, do you think about the ratio of the land use, what you're trying to do to sell versus what you need for bees to do? Like, what, 
Yeah. What are the numbers? Yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> Other people do know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Xerxes has this great worksheet for farmers uh, and forest managers. It's like, how is my ecosystem already benefiting pollinators? Uh, they're working on one of those four cities, um, municipal spaces. Um, which is incredible. And I don't know if it's on a city scale or like the individual park scale, but um, helping you to think about how to improve your spaces. Yeah, and what kind of the ecosystem capacity of bees is something that we're figuring out, right? Mm -hmm. How to, but having more diversity of things flowering all summer is great. Having a diversity of spaces for our solitary bees to live is great. Um, most of them are stem dwellers or soil dwellers. Um, yeah. So this is a, a older graph. Yeah. Um, did you say that, that the almonds have to be uh, pollinated just by honeybees, or can they be pollinated by other types? Of they are 100% insect pollinated. I think. I don't know about almonds' evolutionary history. Is who they evolved with. Uh, be wise. If anybody wants to write this book, this is a book I really want to see. It's like <laughs> who uh, evolved with who. Yeah. So I think that almond pollination needs can be met by other bees, right? Um, but we rely on honeybees uh, because of how they're grown. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the reasons why bees are having a hard time are multiple interacting factors. So uh, pesticides are part of the issue. Lack of forage is part of the issue. And then for honeybees, there's this parasite, the varroa mite, that eats your fat body, which is also your where your immune system is housed. I'm learning more about that part. Um, and makes you weak, vectors all these other diseases. Um, the reason that this slide, uh, this is Marla's civic slide. She runs the U of M Bee Lab. She has a different slide now that kind of uh, pulls out a couple of these different pesticides. These in-hive pesticides are things that as beekeepers, this mite is an arachnid, and our honeybees are insects. So using something in the hive that kills this arachnid without killing the insects uh, or harming them is pretty difficult, right? Varroa mite is uh, uh, evolved with Aphis serena, this other species of honeybee native to East Asia moved over to Aphis mellifera, the uh, European honeybee that we have in all of the Americas um, in like the turn of the century, but showed up in, uh, I think, Florida in the late 80s. And it was pretty epidemic right away. And as a beekeeping industry, we all used one uh, pesticide that then ended up being toxic to our bees. And then the mites became resistant. And then we all used one other one. And then the same thing happened. But now we have a diversity of treatments for mites, and this issue is not uh, as big a piece of the puzzle as it looks in this graph. So, um, yeah, that's the piece that I need to uh, improve on. <laughs> but when you think about the pesticide piece of the story, we talk a lot about this class of systemic insecticide, the neonicotinoids. The Xerxes Society has this wonderful easy to read report that summarizes where we use neonics, how bees can be exposed to neonics, and a summary of the science to date. This came out earlier this year. Um, they also have an updated annotated bibliography that incorporates research that came out after the study did, but um, about how and why neonics are impacting bees. They are absolutely part of the story of pollinator decline. And as somebody who talks to our representatives and the diversity of our representatives every day in the com not every day, every year <laughs> um, in the conversations that we were having with folks this year about this story of neonics role in pollinator decline, it wasn't debated in the same way that it has been last year. So we are all recognizing that this <coughs> is part of the story. And the thing that's still being debated is uh, how big a role this plays, and uh, politically, what should we do where, right? Um, flowers are more apolitical than pesticide usage, based on who makes money off of what, right? <laughs> There's a lot of money to be made through the sale and use of these chemistries. Um, 
they affect, affect bees in a diversity of ways. So as a pollinator, as a drone honeybee, the male, your sperm count goes down if you're in, uh, exposed to neonics by something like 50%. So if you're a queen honeybee who has sex with that drone, all of your eggs are 50% less viable than they would be if that drug wasn't exposed. If you're a honeybee worker who's exposed at high enough levels, maybe you die outright. More likely you're exposed at a sublethal dosage, so you get confused and you don't find your way home. Or you get confused and you stop feeding the larva, so you don't, aren't able to raise that next generation in the same way. So these impacts are things that were, uh, there are diversity of impacts and there, uh, there's more and more research kind of every week on the different ways that um, honeybees and other pollinators are impacted by these neonics. And neonic in this slide, there's something, uh, oh, I thought I put a slide in there, I didn't. Maybe it's later. Something that we use very prophylactically and our agricultural system, 94% of the corn that we grow in the country is coated in a neonicotinoid before it goes in the ground. In Minnesota, about half of our soy is coated. And with corn, it's coated at the, uh, what, the seed distributor level. Uh, we have some seed distributor facilities in Minnesota, but a lot of that happens out state. So as a farmer, when you order that crop, um, you have to order it way ahead of time if you don't want that neonic on your seed. And the reason farmers are applying these is because they're insecticides, right? They hopefully kill the insect pests that farmers have trouble with that ultimately will lessen your yield and lessen the amount of income that you get as a farmer, right? Um, we're seeing with soybeans in the upper Midwest that these neonicotinoid seed coatings are not effective in uh, dealing with our main soybean crop pests, the aphids. Soybean uh, neonic seed coating is active in early June. That crop pest is active in July. They miss each other. With corn, there's more research coming out. This is a spot where a lot of folks are looking at now. Um, that that corn yield is also not improved. So Christian Krupke is in Purdue, I think, is a researcher that studies neonics and bees. And uh, his research came out, two year study came out a couple weeks ago. And um, in the different cornfields that he looked at, there was one case where crop pest uh, numbers were lower with this neonic seed coating, but ultimately it didn't impact yield. So we've been talking a lot about agriculture, right? As city folks, neonics are available for us to use too. As homeowners, you can buy them, um, not in Maryland anymore, but everywhere else. Um, and on city property, uh, we'll talk about how they're used in a minute. So I put this in here because Minnesota is doing a lot of great work. Um, we have Governor Dayton last August uh, issued an executive order for pollinator protection. Uh, this is not something that came out of nowhere. So in 2013 or 2014, the legislature charged the Department of Agriculture to review those neonicotinoids to see if they actually had impact on pollinator decline. They concluded the same thing that the Xerxes report concluded, that yep, if you look at the science and all of the science to date, these absolutely are part of uh, the issue for bees and part of the story of why bees are having a hard time. Um, there are several recommendations that came out of this report. Two of them required legislator, legislative approval and those things did not get legislative approval this year. But there are several other pieces including education for farmers that are still moving forward. Yeah. Um, so that work of Governor Dayton's, the reason that we did this neonic report in Minnesota is because we, we care about this issue as Minnesotans. So the Minnesota Environmental Partnership, which is office just across the street, is an organization of um, environmental nonprofits that work together to lobby the legislature on environmental issues. They also survey us Minnesotans about environmental issues that we care about. We care about pollinators more this year than we care about water quality. What? <laughs> so um, we always care about water quality a lot. So I think that says <laughs> more about the pollinator issue than it says about water quality. But 87% of 
of us is very concerned about pollinator decline, are very concerned. So that has translated to local level changes. Yeah. I was just curious, um, based on some of the research you've done, when you quiz some of your students, um, what percentage are you able to repeat the term neo without a mistake? <laughs> Maybe ten percent, right? <laughs> so, and I said it wrong for a long time. <laughs> and I say this word both days, right? So, if you are feeling not confident about it, you can say neonic, right? A shortened version. It's neonicotinoid. It's the long version in the way that I say it, right? We all have different pronunciations for things. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so we have over 30 pollinator-friendly municipalities now, so cities and counties and school districts, uh, townships that have said, this is the land that we manage, we're going to manage it in a way that's friendly for bees. We're going to plant more things for bees to eat and live in. We're going to not use these neonicotinoid systemic insecticides um, as a city on our property. And then we're going to tell everybody that we're doing this, including the EPA and the MDA and these folks that make bigger decisions. Because all these cities have passed these resolutions, because Minnesota cares, uh, Governor Dayton issued his executive order. So he didn't come out of nowhere with it. It was something that we all, uh, as local change makers, do. Um, yeah. So. In terms of the neonic pieces of uh, city policy, um, we've talked a lot about that one class of systemic insecticides. There are so many different kinds of pesticides that are being used in our country all the time, right? Um, those pesticides, when they're registered for use with the EPA, you just have to register your one ingredient not even all the inerts in that pesticide, but the main active ingredient as something that is non-toxic to these list of things, um, based on existing studies, right? With neonicotinoids, they looked at uh, something like the half-life, uh, when 50% of adult honeybees would die, that was the like target level of exposure, right? Like you don't want more than that or something like that. So I'm saying this wrong. <laughs> but honeybees are big compared to all of our other pollinators. They're not the best species for doing that, um, using as a uh, stand-in for all other insects, right? Bumblebees are bigger than honeybees, but Dr. Judy Wu Smart is a researcher who got her PhD at the U of M bee lab, found that bumblebees were more exposed at, uh, more impacted by exposures than honeybees were to neonicotinoids, even though they have bigger bodies. Um, so, you, this registration process with the EPA is what it is, but you definitely do not have to consider how your pesticide interacts with all the others that we're using in the ecosystem. And with a honeybee colony, these honeybees are going two to three miles to gather food. It means that there's something like, in the average honeybee colony, a hundred different pesticides interacting. So this is insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, we're seeing that fungicides have a hard to play in the story of pollinator decline. There's more research on this all the time. And the burden of this research is on us instead of on the pesticide manufacturers, which um, I resent. <laughs> um, yeah, so that uh, other pesticide piece of the puzzle and thinking of land management uh, is something to consider. And there are some uh, cities and park systems around the country that have transitioned for organic land management. So for cities, um, and talking to folks in St. Paul and Minneapolis, um, there were kind of three main places where neonics could be part of the ecosystem within the city, um, city managed spaces. So Japanese beetles on premier athletic fields are typically treated with neonicotinoids when they're gross. Um, in greenhouses, neonics are part of the toolkit for greenhouse growers. And um, so if your city grows plants, that's something to consider. Um, checking in with the growers you purchase from is also important because they could be using neonicotinoids. Um, a lot of the big growers in Minnesota, like Bachman's and Gertens, have transitioned away from neonic use. And the reason they have is because big purchasers, small purchasers, all kinds of folks 
have expressed concern and have asked that question, are you using these? This is why I'm concerned about them. Yeah. Um, this uh, process of organic land management is not a one-to-one -one easy switch, but it is a relatively easy three-year transition, right? It does require a little bit of uh, money put into that pot to start that transition, but it's kind of like installing solar panels, right? There's cost up front, but then you recoup expenses over time. And Beyond Pesticides is a national organization based in D.C., but they have free organic land management trainings to help cities and counties, townships transition stuff. So if you're interested in this, let me know and I can introduce you to some folks. Um, I was you mentioned about the, like on a big field, like that, but it feels so have they found an alternative to that? Or right. is it simply because it's just a waste site for growth technology and stuff? It's, yeah, yeah. It's not an integrated landscape in this area available. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they like eating, I think, grass roots, and there's tons of them, right? And it's a pretty wet space, so that's good for them, too. There have been some, and I don't know that much about this, so. <laughs> Um, but some kind of one-to-one -one treatments that you could use, but you need to have all your neighbors do it too. Otherwise, if everybody else is not doing this, all of their grubs will come to your spot. So um, kind of longer term, bigger transition practices are, uh, yeah, something that there is national resources to help you do. And also uh, longer term, something that will save you money and also get you notoriety because so many few uh, cities and parks have this organic land management um, piece of their uh, total management strategy these days. So you, you'd be nationally recognized, right? Um, so how do you do it? This is geared more towards uh, individuals, right? So Shoreward, Minnesota was our first city to pass a pollinator-friendly resolution, and it happened because one woman got really concerned about pollinator decline and brought uh, one of the bee decline movies to her city council and said, will you watch this with me? Will you learn more about this issue with me? Will you figure out how we can do something? And they did. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. Um, a lot of, in a lot of cases, a lot of the management practices that municipalities already have are good for pollinators. And officially declaring yourself pollinator friendly means that you get this notoriety, right? You might have to change a few things, like uh, figuring out what your current practices are, figuring out if neonics are part of that toolkit now. Um, yeah. There's, um, so my organization is a resource for this. Humming for Bees is the Shorewood organization. Um, and then Pollinator Friendly Alliance is based out in Stillwater. And Pollinator Friendly Alliance has been doing a lot of work with Washington County, with Stillwater City and townships to figure out on the ground what does this resolution mean? How do we change our roadside management practices to really benefit pollinators? Um, yeah, so they are an excellent resource to talk to for management strategies. And they have a workshop every year where they share the lessons that they learned that year. Um, there's some national resources too. Xerxes Society is such a great one. Beyond Pesticides has that organic land management training. Pesticide Action Network um, and Beyond Pesticides have good databases. Xerxes does too. Um, uh, okay, so we're using this chemical. Is it uh, part of the story of pollinator decline? Um, and then the Center for Food Safety has done a lot of research on uh, nurseries that have transitioned from neonic practices, um, just case studies from around the country of different um, management styles, uh, and also some studies of neonic and atoids and their other impacts. So we talk a lot about pollinators, but neonics are in our water these days. They compromise the health of aquatic invertebrates and then of other things that eat those aquatic invertebrates. Um, and then there's these local organizations like mine too. Yeah. Uh, so St. Paul is a pollinator friendly community. A lot of the rest of you are from agencies, but if you are already a pollinator friendly city, we're working on 
getting together, talking to each other more. So we have 30 plus of these municipalities, and if you're part of one of them and you're interested in helping uh, us organize and talk to each other more, let me know. Yeah. Uh, and this is me. Does anybody have questions? I have a couple from the webinar. Okay. Um, first one is, can you touch on the importance of our native mason bees and what if we as a city can do to help encourage habitat for mason bees? From my understanding, they're more productive pollinators than honeybees, and most types of mason bees are singular, not colony types. Correct. Yeah, so mason bees, we have, I think, several species of mason bees. They're solitary. Um, if you've seen those uh, bump bamboo clusters or logs with a bunch of holes in them, uh, mason bees are stem dwellers. So if you put these habitats up for them, it's more space for them to live. Mason bees evolved here, for, so for plants that evolved here too, they're good pollinators and often better than honeybees. Um, there are a couple great resources that I didn't put on here. Heather Holm is a local entomologist and has some great books, Pollinators of Native Plants, and a new one called Bees. A field guide, I think. Um, <laughs> and they both have great resources, as does her website, on what to plant for who. Yeah, so it has mason bee sections. And maybe a whole garden design for mason bees. Yeah. The things, I, I spoke a lot about honeybees because of their role in our food system, because we have all this data on them. But the same issues that honeybees face, all of our other pollinators face. So improving things. And those pollinator-friendly city action steps to improve things for bees improves things for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Are people keeping track of the percentage of bee populations in our city? Cool. Is it happening? Is they There is. Uh, are some statewide efforts to track who lives where bee-wise, and there are some city-specific efforts, too, but that's absolutely something that's needed more of, right, that we need more of, yeah. So, um, i say the Monarch Lab and the Bee Lab at the U of M are great places to start for that. There's a number of citizen science projects uh, tracking bees, and the U of M Bee Atlas, I think it's an extension, is a, a good place, yeah, to look for bee counts and how to get involved with county. Yeah. So I'm thinking about city resolutions, pollinator friendly resolutions, and Shorewood's, <clears throat> I think Shorewood's talked about changing city operations practices, um, uh, putting inf information out for, <clears throat> for the public and sort of residential commercial management. Um, I'm trying to think if there were other elements, but what, what sort of elements would you, and have you seen in other resolutions? Right. Um, if you're interested, I can share a two, three page document I put out about best language and why um, in resolutions. These resolutions all deal with the land that city manages because we are a pesticide preemption state. So at the state level, uh, we regulate pesticides. And no governing body smaller than the state can regulate pesticides any more stringently in any way than the state does. So the city can't say, we're regulating neonic use for homeowner purchase, or we're regulating neonic disposal. They can say, on our land, we're making this choice. Um, yeah, so habitat is a piece of it, um, and then the different ways that, looking at the different ways you use pesticides on the different land that you manage, and transitioning those practices, yeah. And then sharing what you're doing, yeah. The webinar, uh, what was the name of the pollinator committee? That you said you serve on, um, and how does someone become part of that? And are there any farmers that are? Uh, yeah. That's excellent. Question. Claudia, do you want to talk more about this? Sure. <laughs> um, so I administrate the governor's campaign on pollinator protection. Um, it's a group of 15 citizens that the governor appointed. Uh, the applications were open last fall. Um, so the, the members are appointed through the end of the 18 months after the governor's term ends. So through, well, that would be 2019-ish then. Um, so those 15 members were appointed already. There aren't vacancies because they've been appointed. But uh, this committee meets every six weeks. And uh, the information about that we can send out uh, the, the website for the committee. Yeah, all the meetings are public. So 
folks can come, share their opinions. There's a it's a six hour meeting every time, but you can follow us on the phone. Um, sometimes we have live web, but that's something that we're working yeah. on. Yeah. And, as a matter of fact, there is a meeting tomorrow. Actually, just to pump that a little bit, um, we're meeting at the University of Minnesota tomorrow in a joint meeting with the Environmental Quality Board. Um, the best part for public people to come to the meeting would be from 11:30 to at the Cargill building on the St. Paul campus. And this is Claudia Hoxie who's speaking and uh, sh we can share her email in the notes, right? Okay. Were there other webinars? Um, yeah, one was uh, what's the best policy of a city to look to? I think that means uh, like a city example. St. Paul's is really great. Yeah. And then uh, Humming for Bees on their website has uh, uh, it's been hard to track because there's so many, but has uh, most of the city's resolutions linked on their website so you can check other ones. And um, my email is up here. You can email me and I'll share those. Uh, Humming for Bees and Pollinator Friendly Alliance and PAN and I put together a, a best resolution language too out of that longer document I have. So I can share that with anybody who's interested. Uh, speaking from a city's perspective, from the other side of the coin, um, could you touch on urban agricultural safety practices? I think that Nadia can, right? I could, yeah. Okay. So Nadia's up next and works closely with St. Paul Urban Ag. Okay. Can you, I mean, I can answer it now, too. Can you ask a little bit more specifically, uh, are you talking about people who are using... Um, good, good standards to regulate. Permitting beekeeping. Oh, permitting beekeeping. Okay. Permitting beekeeping, you can email me about. But um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Edina, Moundsview. Edina and Moundsview have newer ordinances. Minneapolis and St. Paul have updated their ordinances recently. Minneapolis became legal in 2009. But uh, I should have said yeah. permitting or slash regulating. Right. Right. Not necessarily. Yeah. Um, in uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, you need a fence around your hives. You need to have taken an education class to say, I know what I'm doing a little bit. Right. <laughs> if you take the U of M B lab course, it's one day and it's totally awesome. And Marla Spivak teaches that class with Gary Bruder. And it's like having Michael Jordan here to teach you basketball. Right. It's a great, <laughs> a great way to learn PGC. And then you pay animal care and control a little bit. I think I talked for too long. Do you, do you have to get neighbors to agree to? Uh, in St. Paul, you have to get 75% of the folks who border your property to agree. In Minneapolis, you have to tell them that you have hives. Yep. Sorry, but I just wanted no? to know, would you read what you said about Minnesota being a state to the state for regulation? Yeah. So that I just want to be clear about what that is. So I think there's uh, most of the states in the country have this regulation, but it's in our pesticide policy um, that the state governs everything to do with how we regulate pesticides. And so no governing body, like no county or city, um, could say we're going to regulate pesticides any more stringently than the state level. And it's been on the books here since the late 80s. Or less stringent for that matter. Oh. True. Yeah, because that's federal law. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> so in order for a city, for instance, to want something more stringent than what the state allows, they have to lobby at the Capitol for that change. Or make it voluntary, some kind of voluntary or aligned with some kind of that so it's or weigh in on the governor's panel. Or create do an ordinance that you can't do an ordinance. No. So that's outside. That's illegal based on the preemption law. Except so the preemption actually says preempt our inalienable right to have a safe place. Right. So um, <laughs> you can join me that at the capital. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's one thing to put in your resolution, right, is that we as a municipality feel like we should have this right. Um, and uh, that's one thing that we're thinking about in all of us having these resolutions, right, and, and talking to each other and seeing if cities are on board with having that as part of their 
lobbying priority um, for the legislature each year. Yeah. Were there other questions? Thank you for letting me talk. To you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I'm going to pass this around. It's just a uh, mailing list if you want to stay up to date with Pollinate Minnesota. So no pressure to sign, but it's coming around. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, we have Nadia Vermesh. Um, you missed introductions, so <laughs> uh, we are here. If you want to introduce yourself and then, you know, say what book you most recently read. What book I most recently read? <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Um, so my name is Nadia Burnish, um, as um, as you said, um, and I'm really honored to be here and share the stage with Erin. Erin and I have known each other for a long time. Um, I've worked um, in food systems um, for quite a while now. I currently um, am serving as a healthy comprehensive planning director for a small consulting firm called Parasoma that specializes in food systems work. Um, I also wear a hat. Um, I co-chair the St. Paul Ramsey County um, Food and Nutrition Commission. So to hear that St. Paul's pollinator resolution is one of the most awesome is great because we helped work on that. Um, prior to this position, I worked in urban agriculture. Um, I worked as a program director for a small nonprofit that supported urban agriculture um, around the Twin Cities metro area and had done a lot of policy work related to urban agriculture. Um, and the most book that I most recently read um, Probably is mighty mighty construction site because I have a three and a half year old. Three and a half year old boy. <laughs> so for those with the preschool crowd, um, no, that's a really popular one. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, thank you um, for everyone who's here and everyone who has joined us on the web. Um, I'm here to talk about. Um, food um, access and what food has to do with cities or what cities can do with food. And um, I talk a lot about how food is the answer to a lot of things, but um, being here with Erin makes me think actually if you back up even a step further, bees are the answer to a lot of things. You can't have the food about the bees, right? Um, and so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, food and working on food access can be a path to health um, and to equity and to resilience. Um, and so when we think about food, um, oh, we'll talk about our presentation goals here. We're going to explore cities' roles in facilitating sustainable food systems and healthy communities. We're going to take a closer look at the challenges that our communities face. Um, and I'm going to share this book that I towed around with me um, that's been out for a little while now. Some of you may have seen it. It's called the Food Access Planning Guide. It's a companion guide to the Minnesota Food Charter. So don't leave without one because I have a present for all of you. Um, I come here and give. Um, but I also want to have a conversation. Um, this is a small group, and I want you to feel free to raise your hands, ask questions, and um, let's talk. So I'm not tied too much to these. The slides are just you know, kind of for, for the benefit of the, the show. Um, our key question that I want to talk about is what can a city do to ensure healthy, safe, affordable food access for its residents? Um, and when you think about food, a lot of times you think about What's, what you're going to eat next? How many of you are thinking about lunch? Right? <laughs> yeah. Right? So, and, and a lot of times when we think about food, it's, it's a really personal decision. And so when we think about food and what cities can do around food, we have to step back from the plate and think about how the food got to the plate. And it turns out when we, when we look at it that way, cities um, and municipalities can do a lot to ensure healthy, safe, affordable food access for its residents. In fact, um, a lot of the food access issues are locally based. When we think about our regulatory structures, when we think about our ordinance structures around urban agriculture, around beekeeping, when we think about our transportation infrastructure, our land use structure, our housing kinds of infrastructures, all of those are really integrally related to our food access. Um, and so these are tied to the Green Step City goals related to food access, right? That's why we're here today to protect and expand um, food and fiber producing land within and near the city and increase the availability of locally produced food for residents and food businesses. So I wanted to make sure we're tying them back to our Green Step City goals. Um, and all the things I'm going to talk about are ways that cities can meet these goals. 
So this is the Venn diagram I like to show when I talk about food. Food is the answer, right? When you think about health and the health disparities we face, we know that those are real in the state of Minnesota. When we think about our resilience challenges, when we think about what um, our energy, our climate change, um, and some of those are emergency preparedness, resilience, and when we think about our equity issues, we think about who does not have food. We know we're not all on a level playing field here in Minnesota when it comes to food access. Um, food comes to the center. So I want to start with health. And when you think about health, a lot of times we think about our clinical care. So what did the doctor say to you the last time you went and had your blood pressure taken? Um, did they tell you you need to eat more or eat, eat more good food, exercise more, those kinds of things? Um, but health really is how often you actually get to go to a doctor, how often you may go to a park, um, how often you're able to get to your job and actually eat a meal or snack, visit with friends or family, actually sleep in your own house or a safe place to live, uh, go to school and use your education. So health encompasses uh, a much bigger um, sphere than just our sort of clinical care. We talk a lot um, in my field uh, about the social determinants of health. And when you look at this chart here, this green swath is the social and economic um, conditions that are around us. That, that's what affects our health, 40%. Only 10% are genes and biology, um, and only 10% are clinical care. So this other um, purple here is our health behaviors, and then another is our physical environment. So when we look at our social and economic conditions and our physical environment, 50% of the things that affect our health are the things that are actually around us. They're not about our individual choices. So when we think about how we're doing in the Twin Cities, um, we're talking a lot, um, very seriously, and in the state of Minnesota as a whole, about how we have some serious um, disparities when it comes to our health. And the Met Council has done some research on this. A lot of our work is in the Twin Cities area, so this stat is from the Twin Cities, so I know we have greater Minnesota folks here too, and this continues to be a problem around our state. Um, we have the highest health racial and ethnic disparities in the U.S. between white, non-Latino residents and residents of color in the areas of employment, poverty, and home ownership. And those are all areas that affect our health. So we, we are doing great as a state in a lot of areas. And we like to celebrate that we have the best parks and the best bike trails and the best lots of things. But the reality is, and a lot of you probably know this, we're dead black when it comes to our racial disparities. So we have a lot of work to do, a lot. Um, so access to healthy foods really is a question of equity. We know that food access is really one of the things that is most important when we're talking about reducing um, chronic diet-related diseases. We know that our kids um, are seeing diabetes rates skyrocket. So we have children who are um, developing diabetes, type 1 diabetes, right? And that never even used to be a childhood problem. Um, it's something that is far more prevalent in our communities of color. So we also know that diet is one of the most important factors related to childhood diabetes. That's, that's just one example. Um, when we're thinking about food access creating, and we're thinking about equity, we're talking about creating opportunities for members of communities who start from different levels of privilege or disadvantage. And that can help not only those individuals and families, but it helps everyone in our community. So it's, it's the idea that we all do better when we all do better, or the rising tide lifts all boats. Um, when we have curb cuts in our sidewalk, for instance, or um, wheelchair access. We also know that um, mothers with strollers and people who are jogging appreciate those curb cuts because they don't have something to trip over and they can get there. So it's a great example of how when we improve one area, it actually improves the environment for everyone. Um, so when we're thinking about food access, how can it improve our environment? How can we 
uh, how can we improve our environment for everyone? And why is it a win for everyone? Because when we address inequities in the food system, we also address cultural and structural barriers. We can address institutional and economic inequalities. We can address human rights concerns. And we can um, improve access and influence to decision makers. We found that food is a great equalizer. And when you have meals together and when you have conversations around food access and how you can improve food access, you're also, in turn, um, having conversations about how you're improving other things. And so if you can start with that, often you get to the harder things. So let's talk a little bit about food and resilience. Um, how we strengthen our ability to bounce back. I've um, been to a lot of presentations recently where resilience conversations are focused on energy. Um, rightly so, we're talking a lot about, in fact, when Abby was presenting the other day, um, as she got up, she said she just got her Washington Post alert that we had pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. It was the most timely um, introduction <laughs> to a presentation I've ever seen. Um, and we, we have a lot on our plate and we have a lot of real, real work to do um, related to climate and energy. That, that's real. And food is a big part of that. Um, food is a big part of it in terms of how we grow our food. Food is a big part of it in how we um, deal with excess food, food waste, um, and how we reduce wasted food to begin with. Um, and when we are talking about the situations that may result from climate change, the major storms, um, or other kinds of disasters that may be weather related, we need to think about how we're meeting our basic needs, our food, our clean water, air, our shelter. And so emergency food um, is also a really important thing for cities to think about. I was recently at a conference, the American Planning um, Association Conference in New York, and one of the most interesting presentations was um, from New York City talking about their five boroughs for food supply. And it's interesting to know that cities typically, on average, have about three days of food on hand. So if we cut off the trucks right now, for whatever reason, we probably have about three days of food in St. Paul or wherever you are. Um, you may have four or five. And um, Hurricane Sandy provided a um, real incentive for them to do some really strong research on their food supply systems in New York and how they can strengthen them. <coughs> in Minnesota, we haven't had that kind of um, serious precipitating event where we thought a lot about our food supply in that way in our emergency situations. Um, a lot of our food comes from pretty far. We have a lot of great agriculture here in this state, but a lot of it is corn and soy. Um, and we have the capacity to grow a lot more of our food here. So I think it's a, a standing question about what our cities can do in terms of our food system um, to make them more resilient in terms of our long-term supply or, or short-term supply in case of emergency. So we know that in areas of food insecurity now will suffer most in emergency situations. So one of the key questions you can ask is where are our most food insecure uh, in our cities and how can we deal with those um, challenges if in an emergency preparedness plan? And then how are the climate changes that we are perhaps expecting um, and both mitigating for and preparing for um, and adapting to um, going to be impacting our current food system and what do we have to plan for in that way? Uh, I think that one of the um, forward-looking um, things that cities are doing um, is allowing more urban agriculture growing in the city areas, more kinds of um, spaces where food, uh, what we would call specialty crops in agriculture, but things that actually can we can turn into food um, on our plate without a whole lot of processing um, is grown very close to us. So when we think about resiliency in food, um, cities also have a lot of work to do with organic recycling and wasted food reduction. That shows um, a tremendous potential for reducing our 
our waste stream and also our carbon. Um, food systems work has a great potential to strengthen social networks for resiliency. Food, again, is a great equalizer, and when communities are working together around food access and are starting to have conversations, we're seeing social networks strengthen. Um, and food production and water quality are fundamentally linked. And I think that that's an important resiliency point that we're, uh, we're challenged with on a state level, but we're also thinking about in terms of our city planning and how are we going to protect our water resources along with the food that we're growing. So I want to talk a little bit about some ways, some resources to help you do that. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Minnesota Food Charter? But not everyone. Okay. So um, I'm here, my work is, is, exists because of the Minnesota Food Charter. And this is a document that was put together through a very robust community engagement process. Over 1,500 people around the state contributed to this document. It is a, a 99 strategies document about ways that our food systems in Minnesota can be improved upon. Um, and it is divided into a few different chapters um, from food skills, food affordability, food availability, accessibility, and then infrastructure. And this guide, this charter, kicked off a number of different companion guides that really get to some more specific strategy language. Um, there's a food retail guide, there's a farm to school guide, there's a early childhood guide. So depending on what you're interested in, there are a lot of resources out there in the food charter realm that can help you figure out what you want to tackle and how to get there. Um, the food charter network is um, endeavor that has existed for about a year. So the food charter was about three years ago at this point published. And out of that work, um, there was a need to organize around those strategies. And so the food charter network is housed at the Healthy Food, Healthy Lives Institute at the University of Minnesota. And it brings together everyone around the state who's working on these strategies. Um, and it works really closely at a state level in terms of a cross-agency work group um, across state departments where the Department of Ed, the Department of Ag, the Depart uh, Health and Human Services, Corrections, the MPCA, I'm, I'm blanking on this, but many, many um, departments are thinking about how, from a state perspective, they can work on food access. From a city and municipality level, then um, the food access planning guide was created because we know we have to address food access on multiple different levels of government, multiple layers. And the food access planning guide is designed for those that are comprehensive planning right now, um, but it's not exclusive to comprehensive planning as an exercise. I think the strategies that are in the food access planning guide are um, useful for anybody who is doing a local government planning process of any kind, really. We're finding that even in greater Minnesota, people are using the language in it um, pretty broadly. And so the nice thing about this tool is it's designed to provide language very specifically to planners to integrate into their plans. So if you're wondering what to do about um, transportation and how transportation relates to food access, you can take this guide and pull language directly from it um, and think about how it relates to the context of your community and tweak that. So it's designed to be an open idea resource menu for um, planners and city government to use in their processes, planning processes. Is this, is this uh, applicable statewide or is it kind of a different metro? It is focused more on the seven county metro, but it has, it is a statewide document. Um, there are communities that are doing comprehensive planning across the state. Um, St. Cloud just finished a comprehensive plan. Rochester is working on a comprehensive plan. Mankato, Grand Marais. So across um, the state, this does happen. Is, um, is it based on the uh, APA 
policy guide? Well, the APA food policy guide is about 10 years old. So this document is actually newer, far newer. This just came out this year. And um, the APA is actually, I'm, I'm part of the food interest group um, that's really interested in redoing the APA food policy guide. Um, may actually use this document as a base for it, for their revised document. So I would say that it's not based on that document. It is a little bit more forward thinking. Um, Ten years ago, a lot of communities were working on urban agriculture ordinances or farmers market locations. Sort of that, that's right now the low hanging fruit for a lot of communities, and a lot of folks have already successfully worked on those issues. So this, you'll notice that those aren't part of this. Um, this guide seeks to be more on the leading edge um, of where we need to be now. So I would say that might be a little bit outdated. Good question. Other questions? Oh, one from the webinar. Is yeah. the um, is that document online somewhere? So we can it is. Um, the link is included here a little bit later. Okay. Yep. So I'll just talk a little bit about how this is um, set up. It should be set up so that your city planners would be familiar with it. It's set up divided um, by typical comprehensive planning chapters. And there's a section that is um, around learning about the comprehensive plan process because it's also designed for community advocates who want to be involved in this process. So we know that a lot of um, community engagement processes are happening around comprehensive planning and planners can use this to help explain the process to the, their communities um, and understand it. And then there's the sample language chapter. Um, the first four, land use, housing, transportation, and economic development, are typical planning chapters. The next five are thematic. Um, farmland preservation, food production, food aggregation, processing and distribution, healthy food retail, and pollinators. <laughs> um, there is a section on pollinators and sample pollinator sampling uh, that you can include there. And so it is really designed, again, to be flexible according to your community context and your community needs and your community priorities. So if you, through your community engagement, learn that actually your community is really concerned about pollinators. And chances are they are because 87% of us care about them. <laughs> what can we pull from um, this language that would help us um, integrate um, pollinator protections into our plan so that we can then implement that down the road? Um, so I hope that um, you can use this. This is the website. So. It is available at minnesotafoodcharter.com slash planning guide. And on the website, you'll also see um, there's a resources tab. And we've put together a pretty robust resources section for people that are interested in thinking about planning and health. Um, there are links to some really great data sources. There are some links to um, some plans that have been completed around the country that include health and food in a really robust way. So if you're looking for great examples and seeing what other cities have done, um, they're there. Um, and then you can also find all the companion guides to the food charter and contact information here. So my job is really to provide free technical assistance. Free technical assistance. Free technical assistance. Um, to communities that want to integrate health and food into their plan in some way. And so I don't come in with a prescriptive um, view of what you need to do, but what I am able to do is listen, and I spend a lot of time listening, um, to what you're trying to do and um, what you're interested in thinking about in your plan, and I can review language, I can provide uh, recommendations, I can provide resources. I'm just one person, I don't have all the answers to everything, but I do have um, a pretty good network and so I hope that you feel like you can use me as a resource. Um, I have some key questions here that you may want to think about with teams if you are doing planning. And some of it is related to data that you might want to look at. Because one of the first things you need to do in your community related to food access is know where you're at. And some communities have done community-based food assessments. Um, or already have some research around what their needs are related to food access, and some of them don't. You, it, this is the first time they've actually they've asked that question. What is the state of food access here in our community? Where are the needs? 
Um, and so these questions are designed to get you started to think about what community members, um, where do community members without vehicles live? Um, how many community members have obesity related chronic diseases? And what are those? And what are the demographics around that? Um, where are the sources of healthy, affordable food? Um, what does the enrollment look like for medical assistance, food assistance, rental assistance? So you're getting a sense for economic needs. Um, how many visits are local food shelves experiencing? Your food shelves you have those numbers. They can tell you a lot about what hunger looks like in your community. Um, how active are our youth and our adults? Where are their physical activities looking like? What are our um, school, our my brain is blanking now. Our, the school survey that is done every year in Minnesota. My health department colleagues uh, would shout it out at me. Mm -hmm. But then the, the school survey. No, there's a school survey that's done every year. And um, one of the questions is around fruit and vegetable consumption. So, what is the fruit and vegetable consumption of our young people? Um, in St. Paul and Ramsey County, um, I think it's I think it's a St. Paul number. Sometimes it's a question of how the reach of the data, uh, what is the reach of the data. I think it's a St. Paul number, and I think that the number of middle school students who consume the recommended number of fruits and vegetables daily is like eight percent. Eight, right? So when you start to dig into these numbers, you get a picture of what the nutrition needs are in your community, what the food access are in your community, and that's a good place to start. Um, asking your community questions around food in your community engagement sessions is also a really good place to start. If you're doing some community engagement around comprehensive planning, ask some questions about food. Because people will talk, they may not talk to you about transportation or housing or land use or zoning, <laughs> as, yeah, they, yeah. as they not often think, but they're going to talk to you about food. And um, what they eat and how often and how hard it is to get it. They're going to talk to you about those things. Um, so those are some places to start. Yeah. So part of your training or free advice dialed in with the part of MDH community health impact assessment work. Yep. I have a couple of colleagues at um, Department of Health that I work really closely with around their planning for population health. Um, for some of their community um, assessments, and yeah, I work really closely. So, other key questions? Yeah. I'm just curious if the document has anything to do about water, water sources, and, and also about long term. I mean, we know that, yeah. for instance, the Oklahoma office. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Yeah, that's a really good question. And as we have um, been working with this document, we've realized and wished that we have done a, had done a chapter on water. We did not do a chapter specifically on water. Um, there are some good resources that we put up on the website around water resources and management, but this guide specifically doesn't. So I can point you in the direction um, of some good water resources. You won't find it. I'm not sure that that's what I was after. Okay. Um, I think it's about, it's more about, okay, we're looking at what's available right now. We may not be getting to whether it's potential wastewater or a rural area or whatever it is, but um, it just seems to me that the charter at long term as well as you mentioned the three main sources of impact is a 10-year plan 
Um, and for the Met Council, it's a 20-year plan in, a, in two 10-year frameworks, you know, so it's looking further ahead than the cities are planning for right now. So that's a pretty long-range plan. I think that there are a lot of things that cities are thinking about. Um, water is one of them. Um, I think that cities <coughs> are thinking about what our technologies are going to look like. Driverless cars, for instance. You know, there are a lot of things on the sort of planning horizon. Um, and so when it comes to food systems, yes, when you're thinking about food systems in 10 or 20 years, what is that going to look like? That's a really critical question. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're encouraging planning for and that this guide was written for. Unfortunately, it doesn't include water. Yes, that's an oversight. I was going to just add that um, <clears throat> city water utilities prepare and send data, <clears throat> I think it's data every year to the uh, uh, DNR, and there, the data includes uh, the trends, water trends in terms of uh, well water, extraction of water from drinking water from lakes and rivers. So, so you have yearly data, and I think it's, I'm pretty sure these reports are public. So. One can look at that <clears throat> and then long term trends as reports in different ways. So, so we, do we do have sort of by city or rather by, by municipal water suppliers the data on um, really sort of fragility of water supply? So, so that's about drinking water. Yeah. And it's like, not about our use of water for the food that is being sourced to us. So 90%. Of the water from the aquifer, for instance, is for industrial agriculture. Oh, yes. Yeah, it doesn't give you a picture, uh, a broad, like, watershed picture. They do track irrigation wells, too. Well, that's true, they do. Yeah. Well, they would have that. You can get right down to the well index level with statistics through them huge. Okay. Okay. Abby, Abby, you're getting at kind of a larger resilience question, which I think is really good. And it's, it's a reminder that, you know, Met Council now has resources and is encouraging cities to look at resilience. And that includes, you know, what does our food security look like if, if the areas that we're dependent on to get food are experiencing droughts or some other kind of, uh, if the aquifers are um, being lowered and we can't use the water, you know, like how, how well are we prepared for major disruption to what we need, um, whether it's drinking water or water for the food that comes to our community or whatever it means. We need to start thinking um, how these global impacts can be having an effect on the state. Yeah, it's bigger than the state. It's true. It's bigger than the state. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I think you raised a really good point in, in not just thinking about what we're going to Yeah. Well, we're are completely right. dependent on a system that's publicly funded to do this. I mean, that's a publicly funded stainless steel that draws all that water And I don't know what the amount of local local resources we actually have available to us, but I'm pretty sure it's a tiny percentage of what we need. So that means that in city planning, you have to think about um, how, you know, what's going to happen to your system if there's no water left that actually grows that stuff to the point of where we. Actually, they're not all only solely publicly funded. There's an outstanding nonprofit organization in Orono, Minnesota, the Freshwater Institute, that deals extensively with that issue. No, no, I mean that our industry, our industrial food system, is publicly funded. I want to go to the couple questions we have. It looks like on the web. Yeah. Um, was the same question that was asked earlier about like, pollinator policies. What would you say which city has the best policy to be trying to keep? Well, I think there's no single policy surrounding food. There are lots of different policies that affect the food, food access to the food system. Um, there are a couple of model um, sort of ordinances that I'll um, talk about. One of them in Minneapolis is the corner store um, staple or the staple food ordinance. Um, that's one that's gotten national attention, um, and it mandates a certain level of nutrition um, in corner stores. 
Um, and that's been something that has been able to increase food access in neighborhoods where, or um, for communities that lack transportation, where that's one of the only sources of food. So the staple food ordinance in Minneapolis is one. Um, there are a number of urban agriculture ordinances that are really good. Um, they're a little different depending on the community's context and the history kind of, of urban agriculture in that community. Both Minneapolis and St. Paul have them, but a number of other smaller communities have them too. Um, and I think that there is no one size fits all in terms of that kind of ordinance. It really depends on Again, the context of the community and the history of that activity in the community, how it is properly um, put into ordinance. Um, and so there, there are a few really good ones out there. There is um, a national um, pro procurement policy called the Good Food Purchasing Program that we've been talking a lot about here. There's a group talking a lot about that here in Minnesota and how procurement could become part of our fabric um, of in, uh, large scale buying in Minnesota. I think that there, um, the good food purchasing policy was something that was developed in LA. Um, and so the context between the food environments in California and Minnesota are very different. And so I think there's some agreement that we would need to update that with a local context. But there are a lot of people talking about how we can do procurement well. There are some really good policies around um, to support um, cottage food kinds of industries or economic development in food. Um, and we've tried to highlight some of those in the food access planning guide and also in the resources section. So food system is big and there are a lot of different um, points, regulatory and ordinance kinds of points that touch it. So there's no single um, food policy. In terms of national food policy though, this is interesting. The um, there is a blueprint for a national food policy that has come out um, because there is no national food policy, but there are um, the cohort, University of Vermont, I think the John Hopkins Center for Livable Futures and a couple of other folks that have worked really uh, carefully on this very dynamic document that is a blueprint for a national food policy. And you can Google that national food policy document and find it very easily and it's an interactive document that was just released in the last couple of months. To follow up on that, though, would you say that are there any Minnesota cities that are doing a particularly good job or, or better at doing food planning for health? Well, you know, that was a hard one. There are, yes, but a lot of them are in the process of writing their comprehensive plans right now. And so um, we haven't seen a lot of the language in the seven county metro area. Um, I will say, um, St. Cloud worked really carefully with their center care, um, their health care center in St. Cloud to integrate some health and food um, language into their comprehensive plan that they're working on for food access. And there's a link to that um, in our resources section and also in the guide. Um, in Cass Clay County, that's another. So some of the things that are done are in greater Minnesota because right now in the Twin Cities Metro, everybody's in the planning process. Um, Lake County has done some really interesting things um, and innovative things. Um, a town called Richfield, California, not Richfield, Minnesota, Richfield, California, um, has taken a really innovative approach to food system planning. And um, that's one I would look at if you're looking for a model. And that's a smaller community. Um, it's not a major metropolitan area. It's less than, I think it's around 30,000 people. Um, so it's not teeny tiny either, but Richmond, California is a good example. Or sorry, Richfield. Richfield. So I have a, a question about the <clears throat> economics of food uh, producing land within cities, and I'm thinking about Greater Minnesota City. And um, I know there's, a, I presume there's always pressure as cities grow, sort of the higher, best use price of land, issues of preserving land, and I. And I also know that sort of taxable land issues, there are certain state uh, levies, and I've, I've a complicated process boiling down to what uh, land gets taxed. But are, are there, as I recall, there are in fact ways that cities or landowners can help preserve land, uh, food producing areas within a urbanizing area? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so if you're only looking at the tax value of land and looking at highest best use, that's not going to get you a number that factors into the other economic benefit of using land sure. as um, for, for agriculture. Um, there have been some economic impact kinds of studies that have tried to quantify those other impacts, um, including the food, but also the community um, connections that are created. And there's been a, a decent amount of research done on how a plot that is preserved for urban agriculture actually raises the property values of the surrounding property. And so the surrounding property tax base goes up. And that particular plot of land may not have been developed, but the trade-offs almost make it a wash. Um, so putting a CVS on that corner or having an urban garden on that corner actually in the long run, when you quantify the increase in tax base around it and the other social benefits and food benefits, food access benefits. Um, so you have to, it's, I think that the easiest and most um, familiar approach is to simply look at the tax base and the highest best use in a traditional sense. Um, but I, I encourage governments to think about um, the value of land in a much more broad sense and what um, agriculture in a well-run uh, kind of community presence, um, what that can do for a plot of land as well. And there's some, there's some data to back that up. Yeah. Was your question based on urban agriculture or more the concern about the traditional contiguous growth of urban boundary expansion? Well, I was, I was thinking of, I mean, a, a city like Pine City that probably still has within it, if not production fields, you know, maybe that small, could have been a <clears throat> two acre, you know, truck park or something like that. And just the challenges to the economics for the landowner and, and producer and, and ways to sort of strengthen the economics of keeping that land yeah. producing. So Dakota County has a really interesting model. So I answered your question in terms of more of an urban setting, but in, in more of a Pine City kind of setting, um, or a sort of on that edge yeah. where there's that development pressure, Dakota County has developed a really interesting land preservation um, model with the tax incentives around preservation. Um, there also was um, a new incentive, tax incentive, that just passed the legislature. There actually was $11 million in the tax bill um, as a tax incentive for um, existing agriculture land to be either sold or leased to new or beginning farmers. So that is something that I think is something is that in terms of private ownership, um, cities can be looking at for a little bit more preservation kind of tax incentive and benefit. $11 million isn't small. Um, so I think there was a real recognition that we need um, younger farmers. We have a generation that's going to retire. That's a real challenge in our rural areas. Um, and farmland is really expensive for farmers that want to um, purchase land and get into it. So that was a real win for new um, beginning farmers. Good question. We just have a couple more minutes. I don't know if there's a wrap that you want to do. I just have a couple more. Sorry for you. Yeah, we are. That's what we can offer. I talked about that. Um, yeah, so I guess we're there. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 Abby, are you planning to distribute uh, I've got, digital yeah, presentations to the, yes. to the yes. staff's program so, for cities? Yes, so we will share the presentations um, with everybody who's attending and everybody who um, lists. <laughs> And we'll also share links to the video, the whole presentation, um, and uh, previous presentations as well, previous workshops there. And um, I just sent an email to Catherine with links of different things that I mentioned and different questions folks had. So um, hopefully that'll get shared too. Yep. Yep. So we'll yeah we'll share everything. Um, and then as always, if you have any questions, follow up or whatever, you can contact me. You can contact Philip. Um, and we can we can link you up with the with the right folks to answer those questions. Also, I was kind of wondering if any of the webinar attendees have been stung by any bees. <laughs> 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 <laughs
<laughs> they look like they're all sitting outside. <laughs> I thought. Oh, we, how do we get a visual from the? Uh, yes. Yeah. Do they enable their account? <laughs> yeah, my contact information um, is online on the Food Access Planning Guide website, and you can send it out with this too. See if anybody has further questions or wants to chat. Um, I'm happy to meet one on one and talk a little bit more about your individual cities or organizations or contacts and, um, and help out.